This is the Type to Process Library, part of the Applied Haskell course at FP Complete. Type Process is a library that we've developed here at FP Complete as an alternative to the standard process library. In fact, it builds on top of the standard process library and provides additional information at the type level about the underlying streams. It also has better handling of binary data. Instead of working with strings, you tend to work with byte strings with the type process library. And it avoids a whole bunch of lazy I.O. tricks. Anyone who's looked at the internals of the process library knows that the way that it's able to pull data out of processes uses quite a bit of lazy I.O., uh, which works in general, but we prefer to avoid it. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, it's highly recommended that when you work with the type process library, you use the multi-threaded runtime. So passing in dash threaded when linking is a good idea. Let's go ahead and get started by just looking at a simple synopsis of what this library looks like. We're going to go ahead and pull in a number of different helper libraries in this case. And notice that we have STM and atomically, we'll get to that a little bit later. For simple use cases, being able to use something like run process com uh, combined with a string works. This string is going through the overloaded strings mechanism, and this is getting turned into what we're gonna see in a little bit is the process config type. So we can run process true and run process false. And I'm going to go ahead and run this entire program right now and so we can compare it against the results. So we can see run process true produces an exit success and run process false produces an exit failure. No big surprise there. Run process with an underscore doesn't seem to do anything at all. But in fact, what it's doing is running the process and then checking the exit code to make sure it's a success. On the other hand, if we did run process underscore with a false, this would go ahead and throw in a runtime exception. We also have read process, again, with an underscore. And this gives you back the standard output and standard error of the underlying process. We have down here the same thing, except we're actually using shell redirections here. When you use a string literal, it's using the shell function under the surface, the shell smart constructor, which we'll get into, which uses your system's default shell. And down here, we see a little bit more detail of how you would really interact with the process. And this is a one-two punch. You start off by constructing a base process config and then applying configuration parameters to it. And then you use some kind of a process uh, function, in this case, with process wait, to go ahead and spawn this config into an actual running child process, and then you can interact with it. We'll go ahead and re uh, reference this code later if you'd like, but now we're going to go ahead and start going through this from the beginning. The basis of the typed process package is two types. It's the process config type, which provides a specification for running processes. Uh, you typically, and in fact, the only ways to construct this are with either the proc or shell functions, or the is string implementation, which uses overloaded strings, which is just a synonym for shell. And then there's also modifier functions, which you can use to make changes, such as changing environment variables, changing the working directory, other things along those lines. Or as we're going to see quite a bit of, playing around with the uh, stream types. Once you have a process config, you can run it, you can spawn it in some way or another, and this produces a process value. And the process value represents a spawned child process. You can go ahead and uh, interact with it using the streams, the get std out, std error, and std in in some way. One thing to keep in mind, both of these types have three type parameters. And in order, they represent standard in, standard out, and standard error. And we'll see how you can go ahead and change these. By default, they start off with unit, and they inherit the parent process's streams. So let's go ahead and have a look at these types. Here we have date config. Date config is going to be constructed using the proc function, which takes two arguments. It takes the command name, in this case date, and a list of command line arguments. So there's no kind of weird shell escaping you have to deal with, which is a pleasure. Personally, I recommend using the proc function whenever possible for constructing proc config values. And you can see the type of this is going to be process config together with these three unit value uh, unit types which, as I mentioned, represent standard in, standard out, and standard error. And by default, they are being inherited. Now we're able to go ahead and start the process, which is going to spawn it and give us back this process value. 
And finally, we're able to, or not finally, next we're able to wait for this process to complete. When it completes, we are going to get back an exit code, and then we can print the exit code, or if we wanted to, we could have stopped the process early, which will send a termination signal. Using start and stop the way that I just demonstrated is not recommended in general. There are cases where you may want to do it, but instead, like most things in Haskell, it's much better to use the bracket pattern, this with approach to things. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and use with process wait. We use the is string, the overloaded strings approach, to say go ahead and, and spawn this with the shell. So we're going to run the date command with the shell. This is going to launch the process, and inside of here, everything is guaranteed to work, uh, is guaranteed to be scoped with this process. When this exits, with process wait would wait for the child process to finish. There's also a with, press, uh, with process term, which would send a termination signal. Uh, and then the final thing to keep in mind is this is exception safe, and that's the important bit. If some bit of the code inside of here throws an exception, you're guaranteed that your process is going to get cleaned up for you. Anyway, coming back to this code, with process wait is going to give us back the process uh, value that is underneath. We can call wait exit code, get the exit code, and print it out. That is actually quite a bit of work just to run a process. So instead, there are helper functions, and this is going to be a theme throughout typed process. One of the helper functions that we have is run process. You give it a process config, and it will go ahead and run the process to completion and give you back the exit code, which is exactly what we had previously. On top of that, we also have the ability to do run process underscore, and you're going to see these functions throughout as well. The underscore version does not return the exit code. Instead, it checks the exit code for you, and if you have any kind of a failing, failing value, so anything except an exit success, it's going to throw a runtime exception. If you're not a fan of runtime exceptions, feel free, go ahead and use the non underscore version. If this happens to fit what you're looking for, you can use it as well. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of people end up forgetting to check the exit codes. So this turns out to be a helpful addition, in my opinion. Now, let's go ahead and talk about how you manipulate the standard streams, the input, output, and error from the process. You can use the modifier functions, set std in, set std out, and set std error to go ahead and make a modification on the process config. I'm going to show you the simplest version first, which is simply to close them. Remember, by default, we're going to inherit the streams that the parent has. Now, by using closed, we're going to close the stream, so there will be no active input, output, and error from this process. So we're going to go ahead and have date using overloaded strings, modify all three of these to say we wish to close these before spawning the process, and then we're going to run it. Let's go ahead and check this out and see what exactly this is going to produce. And you may be a little bit surprised. This produces an exit failure because when the date, uh, the date process tries to write to a standard output, it's not able to because there is no file descriptor there. Generally speaking, this isn't what you want to do. It can make sense in many cases to close standard input so that there's no ability to read something in, but output and error, usually that's not what you want to do. You either want to capture it or use one of the other helper functions inside the, uh, inside the type process library to ignore some of the data. So anyway, moving on from here, another common thing you may want to be able to do is create a pipe. Pipes are very useful if you need to be able to interact with the process. Instead of simply collecting, uh, you know, dropping all the data, or collecting it, which we're going to see in a bit, if you want to be interactive with the process, you can go ahead and create a pipe. And a pipe is going to be bidirectional, so you can send data from your parent process to your child process. You don't have to wait for everything to come in batches. So here we're going to say that standard output should be a created pipe. Notice how the types have changed now. Date config no longer has three unit values. Now the second type parameter here is handled. And that represents the fact that the standard output from this process is going to be available to us as a handle from system.io. We've gone ahead and created this process config. We're again going to use with process wait. I'm using the underscore version so I don't have to deal with the exit code myself. And now I'm able to use the get std out accessor function 
on the, on the process to be able to get a handle. Once I have that handle, I can use my standard hgetContents from data.bytestring, and that is going to read all of the content as a strict byte string uh, and until it gets to the end of the stream. So this is actually in the way that date works. This is going to wait until the process is completely finished. And then we're going to get back our, our byte string and we can do whatever we want with it. We could be much more interactive. The synopsis gave you a demonstration of being more interactive, uh, but we're sticking to simple examples right now. For a simple example like this, this probably seems like overkill for the ability to simply capture standard input and standard or standard output and standard error, and you'd be correct. There is a built-in uh, alternative to create pipe called byte string input and byte string output. And this can be very useful, and we're going to use, we're going to do some base64 encoding to demonstrate it. Let's go ahead and copy this over and play around with the code a bit. So in this case, we're saying let's start the, the base64 process. This time I'm using the proc smart constructor, no arguments. I'm going to set the standard output to byte string output. And that produces this type here. Notice that it's wrapped in STM. We use STM so that you're able to more, more easily work for multiple processes with these outputs. There are also, as we'll get to much later, uh, there are alternatives to wait, you know, the uh, wait exit code, which take which work in STM instead of working in IO. So everything here is really designed to make it easy to do asynchronous programming. Anyway, what set STD out with a byte string output is going to do is it is going to make sure that there is a separate thread. That thread is spawned. It's going to pull all of the data out of the handle that's created. So under the surface, it's still doing a create pipe. You just don't have access to that handle anymore. The library itself is going to get that handle, and it is going to pull data out of it. And when it finally exhausts everything from the handle, it will fill in this STM value. By the fact that this is STM, if you're familiar with STM, you know that you're able to pull to check whether the value is available. You're able to go ahead and, and block on it, wait for it to be available, whatever it is you want to be able to do. Uh, STDN is actually a little bit simpler. Byte string input, you provided a lazy byte string, and all of that data will be provided directly to the child process. So in this case, let's go ahead and run this. And we're going to see the base64 encoded version of the string, hello world. You may be wondering, is this lazy IO? Why are you using a lazy byte string? Lazy byte string is used here not for any kind of laziness. There is no lazy IO going on. A lazy byte string simply means you aren't required to keep the entire, uh, the entire data in a single buffer in memory, which can be a little bit more efficient if you're dealing with large inputs or large outputs. Even that was too complicated for a simple case. So there is a helper function, read process, which runs a process. It runs a process config, in fact, and that's going to be an important bit here. It runs the process config, and it captures all of the output and all of the error, as well as the exit code from a function, from a process. Sorry. Let's go ahead and run this. And as you'll see, we got exit success, we got the output, and we got the error. We can replace this with an underscore version if we want automatic checking of the exit code. And in this kind of a case, we don't actually care about the error. Maybe we want the error stream to be inherited from the parent process. That makes sense in a lot of cases. So we can say read process std out to only read in the std out. And sure enough, we get the expected output. Redirecting to a file, ah, that went off the screen, too bad. Redirecting to a file is also possible. This is something where you would go ahead and create a temporary file, and uh, then you can provide your handle directly. So let's go ahead and check this out. So I'm going to use the with system temp file function from the unlift IO package. This is going to create a temporary file and provide me with the file path and with the handle. Uh, I'm not actually going to, oh no, I am going to use the file path at the end. I take that back. Now I'm going to do the same thing we did before with date. Uh, I'm going to set standard in and standard error to be closed. Not strictly necessary for this example, but I'm going to do it anyway. Now the standard output is going to be use handle close of h. What this means is go ahead and redirect all output from this process to the given file handle. And when the process completes, close the handle. 
There are cases where you would want to go ahead and keep it open. In particular, if you want to go ahead and reuse a handle, have multiple process runs, all fill up, say, a log file as you run through a series of different processes. Uh, now that we have this config, we can use run process underscore to let it run. And we no longer have to capture the output ourselves. The output has gone into the file. And now I'm able to simply read the file and print the output. Similarly, and I'm not going to go too, too into depth here. Similarly, you can read standard input from a file. In this case, I've created a temporary file that has hello world in it. I close the file so that it's available for reading. Uh, so it's flushed, the data is flushed and it's available for reading. And now I'm going to do with binary file, open the file for reading, and set the standard input this time to use handle close. There are lots of other modifiers available. Uh, two of the most common things you may want to do with the child process is modify the environment variables that it has and modify which working directory it works in. So for example, you can set working directory or you can set env to set a the complete set of uh, environment variables. And there are many other uh, modified versions of this to be able to tweak things a little in, in different ways and more ergonomic ways. Uh, you may have noticed that we already pulled an unlift.io uh, there is a dependency on unlift.io, and in particular, the typed process package automatically lifts functions wherever possible to monad.io when possible, and when it's not possible to monad unlift.io. Uh, those are for things like with process. The uh, process interaction functions all work, all have either an IO version, which works with monad.io, or an STM version, so that you're able to go ahead and interact with multiple processes safely from an inside an STM block. Uh, this is all intended to work very nicely with the STM and ACID packages, or my recommendation, go ahead and use the NLIFT.IO package or the RIO package. Uh, these provide the STM and async functionality inside of it. And also, if you're coming from the streaming data side, if you're familiar with Conduit, the Conduit Extra package provides a module called data.conduit.process.extra. There is a lot more to this library. Hopefully, this gave you a good overview of how to interact with it in general. You can go ahead and check out the Haddocks to get much more information about individual helper functions. Anyway, hope that was helpful. Hope you learned something. Uh, talk to you later.